it's really difficult to find great executives. Spirit Consulting helps organizations find all-star executives and hire the right one using work psychology so you can serve more customers and grow your business. To get a free quote, go to spiritmco.com. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to the Virtuous Heroes podcast. So excited to, to be able to connect with you today, Katie. Our first question is always, who are you? Hi, I'm Katie Lawrence. I am I'm a leader in the healthcare space. So I have been with a health system in South Carolina for about the last 12 to 15 years. And I, I'm not clinical by background. Um, my role is in administration for the health system. And I work with medical practices, really doing a lot of work on connecting different groups within the health system. As you get into a large corporate space, um, whether it's healthcare or any other industry, there's a lot of room for um, connectivity and a lot of room for things to get dropped between those various entities. So a lot of my work is um, connecting folks and making sure that we make the right, um, right next steps, no matter what the project is or initiative is for our patients, and that we're always being mindful of our physicians and other team members who are really carrying out that work that impacts our patients so directly. So do you stay present? Uh, I saw that you had a little kitty cat that just jumped out. Uh, I think they wanted a cameo into the podcast. He must have. <laughs> what's, your, what's your cat's name? My cat's name is Hank. Hank. Hank the cat, yes. Hank the cat. I love that. He, I, um, I like have an extra special place in my heart right now for, for animals because we – we, I was telling you pre-roll that we just moved, but right before that, we also got a pug puppy who's oh my a goodness. pug and <laughs> he's 10 months old and, and sorry, she is 10 months old. I'm thinking about Hank the cat. So she, Cece, Cecilia is the, is our pug's name. And she has just been bringing so much joy into our lives right now. And uh, so that's so funny that Hank jumped in. So, so good for that. outside of uh, the work that you do in healthcare, Katie, who are you besides that? Yeah, absolutely. So I am, um, I'm a wife and a mom. I have two boys who um, are very avid baseball players and they, um, so they are 12 and 15 and love to, interact on the baseball field and participate in their sporting events. Um, as far as me personally, I love to talk to groups or individuals about wellness, about um, avoiding burnout, about how do we get teams to work together well and maintain an interest and sort of a conscious awareness of who those what those needs are that may vary from team member to team member or from um, individual to individual. So whether that's a team of, you know, ball players or whether that's a team in healthcare or any other industry, I think it's important to remember that we are each our own person and that we each bring our own history and our own experiences and our own view on the world, um, which is shaped by all the experiences that we have had and that Generally speaking, we're each trying to do the very best we can. Nobody goes out on the ball field to mess up. Nobody goes to work to mess up. Um, and so I think it's really important that we each learn to think through um, and to pause and, and take notice that that someone who is maybe making you angry that day or <laughs> maybe ruffling your feathers in a certain way, how do we pause and make sure that we are really looking at the, the point of view that perhaps they're just coming at things from a totally different perspective. So um, lots of openness to continuous learning. I love to listen to podcasts. I love to listen to speakers who, you know, bring different insights from around the world or different cultures or, um, you know, different parts of even our own country, because there's such different experiences that everyone brings to the table. So, hmm. so what are, what are some of the podcasts or what are some of those? Uh, yeah. Just tell us some more, like specifically, what are some of those things that pique your interest or people you're following? Yeah. So I love to listen to Brené Brown. I think she's a phenomenal speaker. I think she brings a lot of insight into just sort of leadership and parenting in general. Um, I often um, listen to podcasts that have to do with burnout or wellness. Um, there are um, other thing that I really like to listen to are podcasts around the Enneagram, which is a um, 
a, I won't say personality typing, but it is a way of understanding the world through different um, personality features. Um, so a little different than sort of a Myers-Briggs or a DISC analysis, where it's really looking at sort of how you show up. Um, the Enneagram tends to look at what motivates you to show up in the way that you do, not just the outcome itself. Um, another podcast that I love is um, Brooke Castillo's The um, Life Coach, I think it's just called the Life Coach Podcast or the Life Coach Institute Podcast. Um, and she's a wonderful thinker who just sort of reminds people to stay present in the moment and to realize that our, our thoughts are shaped by our experiences and that having those thoughts um, then in turn impacts our emotions, which then in turn impacts our actions and, and that our actions are what result. So um, lots of different models on how we think, how we act, how we show up as humans and um, just that those little, little nuances can make a big difference when we're talking about outcomes. So. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. I will definitely have to check out some of those resources you just shared as well. Um, awesome. And uh, so can you tell us, Katie, a little bit about your leadership journey and how you got into the position that you're in today? Sure, absolutely. So I graduated with an undergraduate degree in economics and Spanish and had no idea what I was going to do with it. I actually went into engineering consulting. Um, so not an engineer at all, but the space of um, helping engineers find the site where they were going to build. Um, I knew that wasn't going to be my career forever. And my husband and I um, moved out of state and I fell into the world of medical practice, um, needed a job, was new in town and sort of fell in. And that was my first experience at a front desk. It was my first experience with insurance. It was my first experience with the whole um, sort of idea of healthcare in general. And when we moved back to South Carolina, where we are now, um, I continued to work in a couple small medical practices and then um, had got my foot in the door with a larger health system. So I began to manage um, one practice and then I had responsibility for a few practices. And then about seven years ago, I was given the opportunity to move into a role that looked across our medical group and really started to make connections. So we were moving to a medical record that was integrated across the entirety of both the medical group and then was soon to be followed by integrating with the hospital, which is wonderful for patient care because then, in, um, especially in times like COVID um, or any other care where a patient is moving from the medical practice space into the hospital and then back and perhaps seeing, you know, multiple physicians, all of that is all together and it helps with coordinating medications. It helps with each physician being able to identify what others are thinking but it's a lot of coordination when you talk about what a primary care doctor wants in that, that note to look like versus a cardiologist versus a surgeon. Um, and so how did we come to a place of making sure that we were being both compliant and the fewest number of clicks, because if you have to click 72 times per patient times, you know, 20 to 60 patients a day, that gets to be a lot of clicking and one little click on an email might not feel like much, but when you're having to do multiple clicks on multiple patients um, for the same rote uh, movement, it, it gets to be a lot. So a lot of my work has been in, um, making sure that we're doing the best things for our physicians and that it's then having that outcome of having the best documentation of care for our patients. So a lot of having to consider multiple, um, multiple aspects and multiple perspectives. So how are we making the highest quality, the lowest cost, the best experience for our patients and the best experience for our providers? Um, that's a lot of needs to balance all at once, especially when you talk about different personalities. So a lot of my work has been in integrating teams and how do we um, stay open to the possibility that someone else's perspective may not be the same as ours. Mm. Um, and so that's been my role for the last six or seven years. And obviously with um, COVID, it's changed a good bit. Um, the focus we have had has been on quick learning. I think healthcare has moved faster in the last two years um, as far as being able to be nimble and do things like have video visits or change the way that we see patients, for example, with drive through testing or drive through vaccination or those things that have come up in healthcare systems across the country. Um, I think it's been an opportunity for healthcare to really grow and innovate and show that we are truly patient centric and not necessarily necessarily health system centric, which has probably been the, the monolith that we have been for decades. So. Mm. so, well, thank you for helping our listeners get kind of a, a viewpoint into your, your journey and, 
and, you know, where you're coming from in, in the work that you're doing as well. So, you know, you had talked to, I mean, I keep hearing you talk a lot about, you know, um, basically like burnout. Was there a period in your career that you went through some suffering with burnout and, and had to kind of go through that trial? Can you speak to that? Like, I'm just curious as to like, why, why that platform? Yeah. So I don't know that I um, ever hit the lowest depths of burnout. I think I'm, I'm lucky in that regard. I think I began to see it um, in others. I began to see it um, becoming a, a real possibility. Now I won't say that there aren't days of my you know career that haven't been um, poor or that I didn't need a change. Um, but I think that True burnout is something that I've more watched um, others experience and have had the opportunity to find tools that helped them before it really took an impact on my life. So I was sort of had the benefit of um, being close enough to some who who unfortunately were going through burnout themselves. Um, So burnout really has three aspects to it. It has to do with um, emotional exhaustion. So you might be really fine at the end of the day, from a physical perspective, you could still go out and go for a run, or you could still, you know, play with your family, but you, you're just drained from an emotional perspective. You just don't have a lot to give. Um, the other aspect is depersonalization. So this is the idea that instead of working with a patient, or we see teachers go through this or police officers, instead of working with that human, um, they just become, you know, the patient becomes that, that appointment at three o'clock, the student becomes that, you know, desk in the second row, right? Like it, they just stop being human and more become tasks or things to interact with, or, you know, tasks to get through our day, something that's stopping us from being able to go home. Um, and then the third part of burnout is really a decreased sense of personal efficacy, meaning that someone who feels like no matter what they do, they can't change their situation. So this might be someone who feels like no matter what I do, I can never impact the lives of children enough, maybe if they're a teacher or no matter what I do, there will always be more patients coming into the emergency room and I just can't solve, you know, all of their problems. Or if I left tomorrow, you know, no one would miss me. It's not about me. It's about, you know, I'm just another sort of cog in the wheel. I'm just here. Um, and, and I could be replaced easily. And I think when all three of those start to rear their heads really high, um, that's when we get into a sense of true burnout. Now I will say that at any given time in healthcare, two thirds of team members have at least one of those symptoms. Um, so it's not as if I haven't ever been emotionally exhausted or I haven't ever felt like, you know what, it's, it's not worth it. I'm never going to, you know, solve the problem. I might be on this list of the people. Right. Right. So it's often that we find ourselves in one or more of these categories and we sort of ebb and flow in and out of them. And that's not the end of the world. Um, it's when those things start to make you sense that, you know, I just want to be anywhere else. Just get me out of here. I just can't do it another day. Um, and really starts negatively impacting, um, truly a lot of aspects of your life. We know that providers and physicians and nurses who are burned out, um, have poor quality outcomes. They have poor patient experience outcomes, but the scarier thing for me is that folks who are burned out also have higher rates of chronic disease. They have higher rates of automobile accidents. They have higher rates of divorce and alcoholism and other, you know, negative things that nobody goes into their career to think, you know, I want to negatively impact my marriage or my, you know, my health or anything like that. I mean, people go into healthcare or teaching or any, any field where you're interacting with people to help other people. Right. Um, And so it's really, um, it's quite a shame when we can, when we find ourselves in such a state of burnout. So, yeah. So what says you to the person that's listening to this right now? And they're like, they're checking the box on all three. What does one do to basically get out of that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of things that um, I think first and foremost, it's recognizing that you didn't get into it overnight. So you're not going to be, there's no quick fix, right? So um, they're definitely, it's incremental. It's remembering to hold yourself with some grace. So you're going to have good days and bad days, and it's going to get incrementally better. Sometimes it's about changing your perspective and other times it's about changing your environment. So there are really eight aspects of wellness. And I think when we can start to 
sort of recognize that it's that wellness isn't just, you know, eating broccoli and going to yoga class, that it's really about much more than that. <laughs> I mean, your, your physical wellness is a, is one aspect, your emotional wellness is another. Um, but having things that keep you excited outside of work. So intellectual, having hobbies um, is intellectual wellness, having a career where you feel like you are making a difference and you might not make a difference every day in every moment, but um, if you can make a small difference in your career on a regular basis, that tends to keep people um, moving away from burnout. So that's occupational wellness. Um, there is environmental wellness, which is the idea that your literal physical environment is either going to contribute to the stress that you're feeling, or it's going to at least maybe it's not going to make you feel calmer unless you go to the beach every day um, <laughs> or go ahead to the mountains. But it, it hopefully isn't just adding more and more chaos to what you are doing. Um, or if it is adding chaos, if you happen to work in an emergency room or happen to work, you know, somewhere that is chaotic, that you have other breaks and balances that are, you're not constantly for, you know, 24 seven in that kind of an environment that you have a way to break out of it. Um, other aspects of wellness are financial, which again, doesn't mean that you are the richest person in the world. It means that you are able to balance what you have coming into your financial situation with what you need to go out so that your income and your expenses are kind of in line. And the one that I find the most important is, um, and that the research shows that you can have all of the other seven, um, but if you don't have spiritual wellness, then you are more likely to be at risk for burnout. And spiritual can mean religious. And for a lot of people, it does mean religious, but it's really um, even broader than that in a lot of aspects. It's about having a sense that you as a person matter and that you as a person have a purpose in being you know, having a life, right? Um, that you are here, you know, for some people, it may be to interact with the puppy or it may be to interact with your family. Um, for others, it's their career that gives them purpose. And for others, it's, you know, sharing a message that gives them a, a purpose. Um, and just knowing that that, that you are valuable um, and that your unique um, sense of who you are is, is important to the greater community on earth. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the biggest factor. Um, and you want to try to maintain, again, trying to balance eight different aspects of wellness all the time it can maybe make you feel like you have to go crazy too, but it's not about being a stellar, you know, an A plus student in each of those. It's about just sort of having an awareness of where you are. And sometimes what we see with burnout is that we can have one or two of those that get really off kilter. And so when we start to um, you know, bring those back into our sense of awareness, we start to see more balance coming forward. And like I said, especially with the spiritual one. Have you been feeling unfulfilled? You want to be happy, but just continue to struggle. One of the best ways to experience joy is by caring for the homeless. A charity I've grown to love, River of Light, food rescues a million meals per year for the needy in Chicago. Imagine how that make you feel knowing that you're helping feed children and veterans. To make a tax-deductible donation, visit riverlightchicago.org. Again, riverlightchicago.org. No one should go to bed hungry. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah, the um, was interesting. I guess the first thing that came to mind was just like, as you were just speaking through that, like, you know, you've got this beautiful, like, green floral background. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you've got Hank the cat who jumps through. So you're like living, you know, multiple aspects of what you just spoke about as to how to, you know, maintain a healthy, balanced life. And, and basically, um, yeah, just, you know, all of those different things that, uh, that if you're going through burnout or you're starting to experience some of those symptoms, you know, different ways to be able to cope through that as well. So, so yeah, so that's, that's excellent. And yeah, I guess I, you know, obviously I, I might, lend towards the spiritual, uh, than anything. Um, and not, and I guess what I'm trying to communicate here is I think all of those things that you communicate is important, but as you mentioned, the spiritual aspect is, is interesting to me because yeah, I can, I, you know, I, I, um, I would say that I obviously at this point for the last eight years, I'm a very spiritual person, but before that time, you know, went through like a 20 year season where I was not at all. I wanted nothing to do with it. Um, and, and just thinking about my own professional career through that period too, I think that ideal today 
you know, having the spiritual aspects connected today, I deal so much better with stress and anxiety mm-hmm. be the, that I wasn't able to do to, to deal with previously before that. Um, and mainly, I think, because I think to, in today's age, like we're all going to go through, you know, wins and losses. Like you can't you can't go to work and think that you're, you know, especially in healthcare, that you're going to have a perpetual high. If you're a physician, you know, and, and you know, you're in the business of saving lives, which by that definition, that means there's going to be lives that are going to be lost. And so there's going to be stress, obviously, with that. And, and how do we how do we actually, you know, channel um more healthy ways to be able to deal with that stress that's coming. And I think the spiritual, as you were saying, is just like a great way to be able to frame, frame, frame that in the, in a greater picture. But at the same side, I think the other element that like, I know for me, at least in the Christian faith, one of the first things that they, you know, when you're like kind of like new to the faith, they always talk about identity, 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 which, you know, as you were talking about, like the value as a way that you see yourself and, and like, you know, recognizing that you have to be able to receive love before you can give it. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of that was really, you know, spot on and resonating very strongly for me, Katie. So thank you for that. And, okay. and, you know, this show is all about, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the virtuous heroes podcast is about inspiring people to live virtuous lives. So I know we talked about ways to basically like, you know, if you're experiencing burnout, what can you do to, to be able to pull through that? Just curious if there's anything else that you were thinking about, like, you know, how to stay hopeful or how any other virtuous ways to, to maintain a healthy balance in your life. Yeah. I think um, to me, the, the power of pausing is kind of an, and becoming more mindful. I think people think of mindfulness as this, um, sort of Zen, you know, you have to be up on a mountaintop and, and totally away from everything. But what I have come to learn is being able to just pause and say, okay, let me take a step back. If I were a third party watching this, you know, on video, what would, what would I think of this situation? Can I see where the other person is coming from? Or can I see where that stress maybe is triggering something from my past? Um, And really identifying. So to me, mindfulness has to do with three aspects. Um, It's, physical, intellectual, and emotional. So what am I feeling physically? What is, you know, is the room too hot? Am I, is the room too cold? Is is my back hurting today? Um, Intellectual, what are those thoughts that are just running through my head? And, you know, are they helpful? Because I think a lot of us really focus on the fact that, you know, maybe we have negative self-talk, but we don't try to replace it (laughs) or we don't try to, um, say, you know what, I don't need to think about that, that, you know, I can choose my thoughts, I can choose which thoughts I'm focusing on, and which ones I give more attention to. And that our emotions come from those thoughts. So, you know, we're all going to have thousands of thoughts every day, but we only give credence to certain ones of them, you know, we may not even think about the fact that the wallpaper has pink flowers on it, or that I just drove by four trucks, but as soon as I buy a new yellow truck, all of a sudden, I start seeing yellow trucks around town, right? Like, Um, And so our mind picks up on things that we pay attention to. And each of those maybe has a different emotional response to it. And so how can we um, use what Brooke Castillo calls the model? Um, And so that is the idea that we all have a circumstance and any moment we're in a circumstance and we're going to have a thought in response to that. We may have seven thoughts in response to that circumstance, Um, but each of those may create a different emotion, right? So some of those are going to be things that you carry forward from your childhood or things from a recent experience or things that you've learned from a movie or, you know, whatever, um, you're going to create some sort of emotion from that. And that's going to create an action. You're going to be more motivated based on some emotions than others. You know, you might have an angry response to something and your motivation is to get up and slam the door. Um, Or you may have an excited response to something and, you know, get up and jump for joy or you might have just a non-response to something and just feel like you're, you just, you know, brush it aside. And, um, and each of those are going to be re- result in something different, right? Like what is the impact? How can we start to think about if I run through this thought, emotion, action, what's going to be the result. And if we take the time to pause and think, okay, before I yell at this, you know, team member, before I ha- send this angry email, maybe I should pause and check my tone in it, or maybe I should pause and see if I'm misreading something um, before I get too stressed out about it, or how can I take my stress level down, or am I appropriately stressed out? I mean, sometimes 
it's appropriate to be stressed out or sometimes it's appropriate to be angry. And I think that it's important to recognize that there aren't good emotions and bad emotions. There are things that are serving you in the moment and things that aren't. Um, and sometimes it's important to be angry. Um, and sometimes it's important to be more moderate in your, your emotional level. So um, it's really about pausing and, and being conscious um, about what that outcome, what that impact down the road is going to be. And down the road might be 30 seconds from now, <laughs> or it might be three years from now. Well, yeah. And I also love that, that pause concept, because I think that's so critical, at least for, for, for me in the, in the agency world, it's so easy, you know, when you're trying to get done with deliverables and you're working through people that aren't even in the same organization as you <laughs> with varying levels of executive stakeholders that are championing the initiative to move forward. And it's so easy to like, just be like, why aren't you responding? Like you committed <laughs> to doing this work, you know, like, and, and just to take that, step, like, okay, calm down. <laughs> Maybe I need to walk away from this. Don't send it. Maybe this is just better over a conversation, you know, right. of actually like sending the email and, and, uh, yeah, I think the the pause is definitely a, a crucial one that that I think sometimes we think in business that everything needs to happen immediately. But the truth of the matter is sometimes, you know, the best thing that you can do is do nothing. Yeah. Just walk away from the situation to really just kind of like, you know, breathe as you're saying, like just recollect yourself, kind of go through like, you know, thinking through like, are some of these emotions that I'm experiencing, are they justified? Am I, or, or is this something that I should be going through and just being able to like, just scan your body and kind of like understand where you're coming from. So that's, yeah. that's very helpful. And, and I know for me, like, you know, in the middle of a move with a business that's doubling with a pug puppy, like there's just <laughs> plenty of opportunity right yeah. to, to uh, just be in a, a state of kind of, I, I honestly think this is like the most, it's so funny, Katie, like, honestly, I feel like all, often these podcast episodes come in like critical junctures because <laughs> And it's funny that today we're talking a lot about like burnout because like I, I do feel like this has been this week has been like some of those times in my life that I think in 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 a working standpoint of just feeling like the most drained that I've been this entire mm -hmm. week. And uh, so, yeah, I think you gave me a lot to chew on and to think about as well. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, Katie, how can people get a hold of you and uh, what your company is doing? Absolutely. So I, um, in addition to working at a large healthcare organization, I actually work with individual clients and also with um, coaching and corporate clients um, through my separate entity, which is Willow Strategy Group. So Willow, like the tree, willowstrategygroup.com um, is where you can find me. I'm also on social media. So I'm Katie M. Lawrence on Instagram and would love to have you follow me there um, and glad to have you reach out. My email is on my website and I'm glad to have folks reach out and ask questions or make that connection and, and broaden our ability to, like, like I said, work with others and learn from folks who have had different and vast experiences. So. Katie, why Willow? So the Willow tree is, um, is a strength and bending. So it's constantly growing and changing. Um, so it grows through seasons where you are going to have a full green season and you're going to have a, a, a season that is more cold and retreated um, and, you know, no leaves in the winter. And so I think that having the seasonality of the tree, but it's also strongly rooted. Um, it has a firm but flexible trunk um, to grow from. And interestingly, trees actually communicate to one another. Um, so there's a lot of scientific research where trees are not standalone beings. They are also in a community um, and can, can communicate and, um, you know, I won't say warn one another, but they, they do, you know, fight back against diseases and musts and smites that, that um, attack them. So um, it's not just a standalone thing. It's more like we are as humans as well. So community is important and the firm and flexibility and the ever-changing um, aspect of, of the tree. Awesome. Well, well thank you. And uh, uh, just more to know there as well. So thank you everyone for watching us on the Virtuous Heroes podcast, where we inspire virtuous leadership. Katie, I hope you have a massively blessed rest of your week and I'm sure we'll uh, talk soon. Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, Chris here. Hope you enjoyed the episode where we discussed all things going bald. <laughs> Just joking. If you enjoyed the episode and the podcast, will you please subscribe on YouTube or Apple Podcasts or Spotify? 
or you could also share it with a friend. That would be tubular. I hope you have an awesome day.